want to thank everyone for coming out to this lecture, and I want to thank the uh, graduate and professional scholars for uh, uh, inviting me and giving me this honor to make this presentation tonight, particularly Brandon Johnson, who's the president, uh, who has been so very, very gracious with me, keeping in touch with me and bringing me here uh, with a, a wonderful uh, uh, program uh, that I'm a part of. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Derek Aldridge, without whom I'm sure my name might have never been mentioned at all, but I really appreciate that, and my good friend, Dr. Jerome Morris, uh, who, who has been my friend for quite a while now, and uh, I just want to acknowledge them because uh, they're here and I'm here because of those two brothers particularly. In any case, I want to talk a little bit because I know we have a, uh, I'm going to try to stick to the script <laughs> and the time, but um, I think that one of the things that we ought to talk about and to introduce this is to talk about the question of social activism today. I think one of the things we should talk about is the spirit of black people today, because when we were talking about uh, Mary Frances Early having been the first black graduate of UGA in 1962, opening the doors of opportunity for uh, black students, particularly throughout uh, this country, in this, in this particular uh, uh, university, uh, knowing that this did not come from the benevolence of whites. We have to remember that because this is a sister who opened the door for everybody who's standing in here right now uh, uh, matriculating through UGA, whether you realize it or not. And so we need to recognize that because that goes to what happened to the spirit of c being this kind of a, not pioneer, but of, of being willing to open the doors and take the kinds of chances uh, that Ms. Early took. And where, what I think that we have to recognize that something seems to be wrong with the spirit of black people today with respect to where we are now. We know that affirmative action came in and has now gone, along with the ideals of Brown versus Board of Education. We know that a lot of the beneficiaries, beneficiaries of affirmative action have betrayed us. We have Condoleezza Rice, at one time the provost of Stanford University, who, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are going to get upset about, worried about Condoleezza, but, uh, you know, we can't even call her a sister. A Condoleezza Rice, Condoleezza Rice was a provost of Stanford University, and she came into Stanford as a professor on an affirmative action program, and yet when she was a provost, declared that she not only didn't believe in affirmative action, but she had no intention of enforcing it. This is where we've fallen back to, you see. Something has happened to the spirit of black people in terms of our commitment since Dr. King was assassinated along with his dream. We don't even remember what the dream was about. Had a dream, something about some little children walking up a mountain holding hands. Don't remember. We forgot about the, the poor people's march. We forgot about Dr. King calling for reparations and the redistribution of the wealth of the nation because that's when he got killed. And we forgot all about all of that. But we just we, so ever since that, since the demise of the Black Panther Party, something has happened to the spirit of Black people in terms of our commitment to our people and to each other. Huey P. Newton called it the spiritual death of Black people. Too many of us are willing to wallow in some kind of measured comfort, you know, like just happy to have a leased Lexus and get a job, you know, <laughs> just happy. For just happy to have some shoes and be able to use a credit card from time to time and just not really worried about freedom. We've forgotten all about freedom, haven't we? Right now we have things like, this is the typical scenario, this I must debate. You know, all these people running around here saying, well, is this a question of freedom of speech? <laughs> is this a question of broadcast rights? <laughs> Is this a question of hip hop, hop and rap? That's what started all this. It was those hip hop rappers using all that misogynistic, nasty language. That's why Don Ima said what he said. And, and we have to say, well, why are these people so upset about it? I heard a brother on, saw a brother on television talking about these black women are acting like victims and we need to stop acting like victims. And this debate has raged on uh, as though there had been hip hop or rap when um, Mary Frances Early was asked by the admissions department of the University of Georgia whether or not she had ever prostituted herself. Wasn't no hip hop and rap around at that time. Where did that question come from? This is not about, this is not about freedom of speech. We know where this came from and this is not about hip hop or rap. Get that out of the conversation. Because the standard for Don Imus was set a long time ago by Thomas Jefferson. He was the first Imus that we can really think about. 
Thomas Jefferson was one of the greatest propagandists of racism in America. He wrote a book called Notes on the State of Virginia. Most of us don't get to read that book either in elementary school, junior high, high school, or college. You have to take special graduate courses to hear about notes on the state of Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson says, well, the reason that we can't end this experiment of the freedom of all men is because there's something different about blacks as to whites. Their skin is like an immovable veil of black, and it's, dis and it's not as beautiful as the mixture of red and white um, uh, red and white of the white race. And, and their hair, remember the nappy-headed hoe? Their hair <laughs> is not long and flowing like our hair. And they tend to have less hair on their bodies, which gives them a disagreeable odor. And they are lazy, and they lust after their women. They do not know how to love their women. They have no art or music or literature. Therefore, that the black is inferior to the white in the endowments of both body and mind. That's why we cannot have blacks in our new experiment of the equality among all men. This came out of the mouth of Thomas Jefferson and constantly gets republished as a beautiful pastoral piece about the state of Virginia. You have today a situation where a white guy in a comedy club can call some black people nigger, and the two brothers in the audience, although I'm not sure why they were in that audience, two brothers in the audience <laughs> don't know what to do. They said, we don't know what to do. Here's some guy on the stage and called them nigger not once but twice, three times. They don't know what to do. I'm trying to figure out why they don't have a case. You have to follow these things if you don't know what a case is. Okay. <laughs> we got a sister at Duke who's now been demeaned as some kind of crazy person because some rich white boys had enough money to buy innocence. And she's the real, she's the real nappy-headed hoe, isn't she? We say, oh, she was just a, a, a lap dancer. Uh, she, she wasn't like the other girls who were scholars. So we, we ourselves began to string, distinguish. We have a brother in New York that got killed with 51 rounds from a policeman's gun named Sean Bell, and his own fiance said, this is not a race issue. Like we can think of some white people that have been killed lately or at any time by 51 rounds from a gun of a police officer, or do we have any history on that ever in America? But this is not a race question. This is not a, uh, this is a question of, of police procedures. Just like when the 92-year-old sister here in Atlanta was blown away. And somebody said, she had a handgun and she fired, so they fired back at her because she was, they didn't know. Now, this is a 92-year-old sister. She got a handgun. You got assault rifles. You've been trained. You young. You got immediate response. Even if she fired, got one round off, which I hope she did. <laughs> she was killed in her own home, 92 years old. And we, what did we say? Well, you had the district attorney the Negro District Attorney of Fulton County, Paul Howard, said, well, the police procedures seem to have been followed properly. Later, he recanted on that when, when people got upset. And you had the mayor, even, of the city saying, well, we have to invest. What is there to investigate a 92-year-old woman sitting in her house, the door kicked in, she's blown away? Yeah. Do you have a conversation about that? I don't know. And then we have people calling themselves leaders talking about, we need to go and have the FBI look into this. Now, is this the same FBI that dog Martin Luther King and probably killed him. It's the same FBI that called the Black Panthers the greatest threat and tried to kill everybody in the Black Panther Party. It had Q Klux Klansmen in them you couldn't even distinguish that were responsible for all kinds of activities against civil rights. This is the same FBI that you're going to go to now and try to find out what happened to a 92-year-old woman. It's shocking to me. It's like going to Massa back in the day and saying, Massa, you know the overseer gave me 25 lashes, and you know I'm only supposed to get five for the offense I committed. <laughs> Massa's going to say, why are you telling me about this? This is why I hired the overseer, to give you 25 lashes. You're going to go to the FBI and ask them. And then we have black academics like Orlando Patterson, running around here trying to explain the low disparate, disparate, disproportionately low representation of black men in colleges as compared to black men in prison 
as saying that it has something to do with the notion of the disconnected black male. We don't want to go to college. That's the theory now, right? Isn't that the theory? I bet there's somebody in this room that believes that. We don't even want to go to college. That's why we're not in college. It has nothing to do with the scheme of things. It's some kind of problem that black people have. We've come to the point where we've forgotten how to even think about why we're even here in the first place. What we are supposed to be, we who are privileged enough to be in this room, I'm saying. That we're willing to suffer our own ongoing oppression without any resistance. That's where we've come to. We have to debate stuff like I've just described. We have two million people in prison in America. Highest incarceration rate in the world. Higher than Rwanda, you know, all those jungle countries, you know, <laughs> all those other countries in Africa. Higher than every country in the world, the highest, highest incarceration rate. Two million people in prison, over seven million people either in prison, on probation, or on parole. Half of them, half are black. Black infant mortality rate is the same as it was when Dr. King talked about double that of white children. We have 65% of the women and children in this country who have AIDS are black women and children. We have the highest rates of prostate cancer death, black men in America having the highest rate of prostate cancer death, not only in America, but in the world. We have the highest rates of cervical cancer and breast cancer death, even though we have the lower, a lower rate of breast cancer as to white women, we black women. We have the lowest education levels despite 50 years after Brown. Highest poverty rates and unemployment, underemployment rate, rates, most of the, more than half the homeless are Highest foreclosure rate and one, less than 1% of all business revenues in the United States of America come from black business. Now this is the reality. This is not the UGA reality. This is not the little elite reality, the five people that figured out how to come here because your mama and your daddy and all these people saved their money and got loans and people signed and lied and stole and did all this stuff just to get you through here. You know what I'm talking about. So we have forgotten about what the real concrete conditions are for the majority of our people and even for some of us who think these conditions are not ours. Because if I were to ask the question, how many people in this room know somebody who is or has been in prison, I would ask you to raise your hand. I guess you're not going to raise your hands. Come on with it. <laughs> Look around. Look how many. So we're not that far removed, are we, <laughs> from the hood. <laughs> Some of us are just a loan payment away. <laughs> we have forgotten about freedom. We've forgotten about freedom. We've forgotten about the notion that I am we. We see ourselves some kind of way separately. There been some problems in between since the days of the Black Panthers and all these old people like me that used to march and raise our hands and act crazy and all that stuff. Of course, there's been some, we had the, 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 the big beat down with the Reagan contra crack moment, noticing how it all came together in one moment. We had the Carter years, you know, Carter has tried to skate through and act like he wasn't part of that regular, that other group, dealing with Noriega and Somalian oil. You have to look these things up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Then we had Bush and his first, the first Bush and the first invasion and attack on the Iraqi people, because that's what it was. We don't even think of that anymore, do we? The Iraqi people don't count, you know. And then that was followed, of course, by the, uh, what I consider to be the final blow for black people, and that was the Clinton years. Now, I know a lot of black people love Clinton. Some of you think he was the first black president. I'm not one of them. Maybe it was his lips, I don't know. Maybe that hair. Some made black people think he was the first black president. But I wasn't one of them. In 1993, within a year of his election, and thanks to blacks, he was elected, what did Clinton do? He went into the last pulpit where Martin Luther King gave his last speech in the world, and he said, uh, imagine him standing there in 1993 and Martin Luther King, where he gave that great speech in Memphis, Tennessee, and talked about, I've been to the mountain, I'm not fearing any man tonight, I might not get there with you. You know that great speech, here's Clinton now, in 1993. <laughs> standing there where Martin Luther King said, and saying, if Martin Luther King were alive today, standing by my side, despite how incredible that would be, if he were here today standing by my side, what would Martin say, he says, to a whole host of black people in this church? 
He said, Martin Luther King would say, I died for your freedom and look what you've done with it. And all the black people hung their heads because Master Clinton had come down there to Memphis. <laughs> Told him what was wrong with him. Said, there's something wrong with you. Martin Luther King died for your freedom and you have messed it up. Now, you know, what I want this to be about in this last part of my little statements tonight is about having an understanding of the concrete condition, having correct analysis. We are not free in America. We have a lot of things that we need to address in a very serious way. So in order for us to come, though, to a correct conclusion and a solution, we have to have a correct analysis. Looking at what Clinton said, how can we talk about Martin Luther King died for your freedom? First of all, what's wrong with that? Martin Luther King didn't die. Martin Luther King was killed. A big difference, isn't there? So he died for your freedom. He's on the cross. He died for our freedom. And suddenly we were free. And then somewhere between 19, April 4th of 1968 and November of 1993, not only were we free, but we messed up our freedom. Now, those of you who are alive and around in 1968 know good and well that we knew we weren't free in 1968, and we knew that because Dr. King told us. He said, we're going to put together a poor people's campaign because half of what is good in America, we have half of what is good and double of what is bad. Dr. King explained that to us. So we knew on April the 4th, of 68, black people were not free in America, didn't we? And then I was around in those days, and I woke up on April the 5th. I didn't see anything different. I was joining the Black Panther Party. We were fighting for freedom, so we knew we weren't free, too. And for 10 years, I was a part of the Black Panther Party. I never saw any real change in the dynamic or the status of black people. And I went forward to 93, and I never saw it. So I'm trying to figure out what, at what moment were we free that we messed this freedom up. Must have been when I was asleep on the night of April the 4th. Woke up in the morning. We have been free, not free anymore. The point, though, is at the same time, around the same time, we had the publication of the Bell Curve. Remember that? Oh, something wrong with black people. The Bell Curve advanced the notion that there's no point in even trying to educate black people, that the SAT was a standard for measuring intelligence. This from some people who had no, absolutely no credentials in the field of measuring anything. Yes, there were two professors and one of them was dead, but they were not in the behavioral sciences, those of you who are involved in all that kind of thing. The point I'm making is they said that the intelligence could be measured. They measured it with the SAT, that the blacks didn't pass the SAT as, uh, as high as the whites. Therefore, blacks were not in inherently intelligent. That's what they said in 800 pages of gobbledygook, 800 pages of gobinoism. Huh? Now, what is the point of my, my statement? Because we have to examine this. What is the SAT? First of all, what is intelligence? Nobody's even defined intelligence. If you live in the state of Georgia, you have one child, you're on welfare, you'll get a check of about $250 a month to live on. If you figure out how to take care of your child and live on $250 a month, I consider you to be a genius. <laughs> now we have a situation, though, where the bell curve tells us that the SAT measures intelligence. What is most people don't even know what it is. It used to stand for the Scholastic Aptitude Test. <laughs> then when I, when I took the SAT, and I became a professional SAT test taker, because I went to the kind of school where they made you take the test like every five minutes from ninth grade forward. <laughs> it was a school for prestigious women in Philadelphia. And so the SAT used to be the Scholastic Aptitude Test, and it was a Scholastic Assessment Test, and now it's just the SAT. You just have to take it. <laughs> you don't even know why. <laughs> Dr. Richard Atkinson said, I'm not using it at the University of California anymore. Why? Because the only basis for the SAT success and the only rate of success is measured not by color, not by this, but by those people who took the SAT test taking course. That is to say, the people who had twelve to $1,500 to take the course so they could become professionals in taking the test. And that's all they are, professionals. So those of you who think you got a high grade and want to say, well, I'm not here for an affirmative action. No, no. I had a high SAT. Goody. You now are professionals <laughs> at taking the SAT. So the question becomes, given the concrete conditions of today, we have to ask the question, if this is true, if these conditions are true, and they are, if the, the half the black, half the men in prison and men and women in prison are black, and all the other things that I've discussed, if these conditions, these concrete conditions re reflect the status of black people in America, either we think there is something wrong with black people, like Clinton suggested in his 1993 speech, or like the bell curve suggested and stated, or we know there's something wrong with the scheme of things in this country.
Now, remembering that Clinton used that as his excuse to give us the three strikes crime bill and the welfare reform bill, hmm? criminalizing the poor, poor women and, and incarcerating poor people in massive numbers. Remember that. John Paul Sartre said hell is a place where by design nobody that's a deep statement, isn't it? By design, nobody gets his need, needs met. Is there, is the, either there's something wrong with black people, and we, we are the disconnected black male. We are, Sean, like Bill Cosby said, Sean Tico and Sean, you having too many babies out of wedlock. We're not even going to get into Bill Cosby. I don't want to use up my time on Bill Cosby. <laughs> In, by design, nobody. So, so what, what, what design is this? And we have to really go back to the beginning. And I'm going to do this very quickly. Because in the beginning, there was Jamestown. You know, they're celebrating the 400th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown in Jamestown, Virginia, right? Now, this is incredible because we recently had this terrible tragedy at Virginia Tech. And it's now being described as the worst shooting event in the history of America. Do you find this to be incredible? I mean, on what planet are we all living? Have we suspended all history? Suddenly, it's an Asian guy has committed the worst crime in the history of America. Got South Koreans running around apologizing to America. Now, this is a state in which is celebrating the 400th anniversary of the founding of the first U.S. colony at Jamestown, which was really founded by the London Company. It wasn't the United States. It was the London Company. Started out as a company. That is to say, the country sort of ending up as a co company too, Halliburton and so forth. <laughs> this is an incredible concept in a state in which the capital of that state was also the capital of the Confederacy. This is incredible in a state in which on the founding of, in order to found the state of Virginia, the entire Powhatan Confederacy had to be wiped out. Pocahontas, all her people and all 30 tribes of the Powhatan Confederacy. And you want to talk to me about a serious shooting. This is the same state where the first African slaves came in the development of the tobacco industry in America. Hmm? Remembering that black people did not come here seeking a better life or religious freedom. <laughs> By 1776, these companies that had formed these various colonies united with each other and declared their independence from England, called it the Declaration of Independence. The southern planters and their northern partners had made so much money off of rice in South Carolina and cotton in Georgia and tobacco in Virginia. They said, look, we don't need the English anymore. We're not paying taxes. We got so much money. We are an independent country. And in the founding of this country, we declare all men to be equal. And there's another thing we declare, that all Africans will be slaves, forming a slave class. 150 years of slavery forming the uh, United States of America and slavery written into the Constitution. It became a slave-holding nation. Now, if we don't recognize this, we're not going to come forward to how we got to Don Imus and nobody, everybody can't understand what the problem is. In 1776, this was a country that was a slave-holding nation. The only crime blacks could commit was trying to be free. And that was punishable by death. Am I making sense here? <laughs> Punishable by death. By 1865, 1861, we had the rise of industrialization, which projected greater wealth for the wealthy. The southern planters didn't like it. The white man got into an argument about who was going to make more money and how. And uh, of course, uh, the, the southern planters had one advantage with the slave labor, free labor base. And so they got into a big dis debate, got into a war. And by 1863, the Confederacy, the South, was winning the war. Hmm? South was winning the war until Lincoln said, hold up. I'm going to do something to undercut the labor force of the South. I'm going to free the slaves in the seceding states. Remembering that the Emancipation Proclamation does not talk about all the slaves. It just talks about those in the seceding states, which was kind of ridiculous since the, he was not the president of the seceding states. They had a president. His name was Jefferson Davis. They still celebrate that, don't they? Isn't there a fraternity here still celebrating that mess? Oh. Cooper. 
Cooper Klux the Klanner. <laughs> Still celebrating the Confederacy. Four years of Confederacy, 250 years of slavery, but please, let's not talk about what happened in terms of slavery. It's too long ago to apologize or talk about reparation, but let's have a celebrate. Let's have Confederate Memorial Month. Remember that one? That was just, just barely didn't pass. And I believe there were some Negroes that might have slipped in there and voted for that. Uh. <laughs> but by the time the war was over, in 1865, after Sherman had burned Atlanta <laughs> and issued field order number 15, the idea was to give the former slaves some place to go, since we had never had any place to be in America, right? And so that we all got a 40-acre plot for every slave family, and we can recall that we don't have that plot. <laughs> we, we're still looking for the plot. Most of us are trying to get the 40 acres. There's some people down there. I, I'm down in South Georgia on the coast there where we're in Gullah Geechee land. We're trying to claim a little bit of land now through the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Well, that's just another conversation, but it's very interesting to know about the Gullah Geechee history. The 13th Amendment was passed, abolishing slavery. Looked like things were going, get ready to go well for black people, didn't it? <laughs> But just before it got ratified, the black codes were instituted in most of the Confederate states like Georgia, in which the black codes governed the behavior of blacks, so that there, was all kinds of, there were all kinds of things you could not do as a black. There weren't very many things you could do. But one thing you had to do was get a job, because vagrancy was the biggest crime a black man could commit under the, 13th Amendment, under the black codes, right? And the punishment for vagrancy was the chain gang. So we went from being a slave class working for free to being a criminal class. It wasn't about driving while black. It wasn't about even walking while black. It was about breathing while black. That was the big crime for us by 1865. And so, and just in case none of this was enforceable, you had the rise of white terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. They were gonna make sure you knew exactly where you were supposed to be in the United States of America. And we went on and tried to struggle, find our parents from, from the slave days, all this other stuff. Went through Plessy, 1896, and the uh, be beginning of American apartheid and segregation and di discrimination in day-to-day -day life. You had Booker T. Washington saying, look, I'm not trying to integrate in your family. I don't want your woman. I just need some money. We can, on social <laughs> affairs, on social affairs, we can be like the fingers of five hands. But when it comes to this money, we have to be united. Robber Baron, the future robber barons of America started pouring money into the Tuskegee machine, did they not? Garvey got up, said, wait a minute, that he's right, came from Jamaica. Let's form an independent black economy. Booker T. Washington did that. Marcus Garvey, in the meantime, you had they said, well, we have to integrate. We have to get educated. Nobody else had to be educated, though. I noticed that. You know, we, we had to be improved so we could be accepted. But in any case, we fought against lynching. We fought to get a job. We fought for housing for all those years fought to get health care, fought to get a seat on a train, like Plessy, huh? spent all those years just trying to live. What was freedom in this country if we couldn't get those things that we needed? By 1954, we found out from the Brown decision that separate was not equal, as Plessy, had to, Plessy decision suggested, as to public education. Court called for the desegregation of schools. Have we ever seen so much bloodshed and so much violence? Talking about the shooting the other day. Let's talk about some violence when some black children decided that they wanted to go to school with some white children. We're moving up to 1962, aren't we? We're in 1954 already. We're just fighting for little teeny things like drinking out of a water fountain in Georgia, you know, <laughs> stuff like this. It's a sad day. So here we are, we're fighting for all of this and, and the Brown decision. People from, from Boston to, to, to Atlanta, well, Atlanta tried to pretend it didn't have a real fight over desegregation of schools, but that's another conversation. Those were nuances and details. And, and out of that in 1955, here's Rosa Parks doing what Plessy did 60 years before. I just want a seat on the bus. I don't own a bus. I don't have, any, I don't have anywhere to go but to clean somebody's house. But I do want a seat because I paid my money. Fighting for little teeny things like this. The evolution of a movement and the moral voice of Dr. King by 1955, uh, by 1955 and the formation of the SCLC and, and SNCC the Student Nonviolent Coordinating, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, 
and the Freedom Riders, and everybody's singing, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. We entered 1960 already. 1963, March on Washington. Dr. King talking about his dream. Moving into the 64, 65 Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, so by 65, we finally had the absolute right under the law to be citizens in America and to vote. Can you imagine taking 100 years for that conversation to take place with all the blood that was shed and all the efforts that were put forward, all the Edmund Pettus bridges and all the other things? Founded, which, I, which I was a part of, we recognized that the problem of black people in America was a problem that was created by design. Hmm? by the history of things, it was written into the script, and that in order to change that, we had to change the script, change the fundamental structure, have re what we called revolutionary change. We attempted to organize our people around this notion of making fundamental change, organizing around their interests, developing free breakfast for children and free clinics program, through resistance to police brutality, brutality, resistance to police brutality, with the gun and otherwise, through coalitions with other oppressed people inside the United States, with the American Indian Movement, with the Brown Berets, with the Young Lords, with the Young Patriots, with the, young, with the Red Guard, deciding that women's liberation was a part of people and that they were a part of us and we were a part of women in terms of women's liberation, that gay liberation was a part of the struggle of black people for freedom in America, that handicapped people isolated was a, were a part of our struggle, and, and that waging war against environmental pollution was a part of our struggle. And we realized that we were connected to all the other struggles of oppressed people around the world. For Limo, we joined a coalition and formed coalitions with For Limo in Mozambique, with the PAC in South Africa, with ZANU in Zimbabwe, with the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and with the PLO. And we supported the Vietnamese in their struggle against the Americans who were pounding them with all their bombs. This is why the government declared the Black Panther Party the greatest threat to the United States of America. It was these assaults, internal strife, much of it created by the FBI, an exhaustion that finally brought the Black Panther Party to an end. And there was a, a kind of nodal point in the entire movement when you really think about it. By the 80s, everything was just about over in terms of any organized effort to fight for freedom, to fight to get the things that we needed to live as human beings, not only in this country, but on this planet. So the question becomes now, where do we go from here, as Dr. King asked, in 1967 when he talked about that blacks still had only half of what was good in America and double of what was bad. The real question tonight, though, is where do you go from here? Where do you go from here? Because people ask me what I'm doing these days. I say, you lucky I'm still you know, <laughs> old as I am, and I am still standing. But if we really want to honor the legacy of Mary Frances Early sitting among us, if we want to honor the legacy and the struggle of all of those people who made a way out of no way for the freedom of our people, if we want to honor the blood that has been shed, you know the old song, I know it was the blood that saved me. That's how we got here. Don't forget that. You didn't get here because you had a high SAT score. You did not get here because you were really cute and you didn't speak like a black person and you had some kind of white uh, inflections in your voice. You didn't get here because you were light or dark. You got here because Mary Frances Early and a whole bunch of people lifted up their shoulders and some blood was shed. You got here because of the blood, and it's your duty to pick up the blood. You could be organizing. I'm not worried about the little uh, Cooper Clucks of Klan or whatever they are, uh, fraternity. I'm more worried. <laughs> you know you're going to say that after I leave, right? <laughs> I kind of like that, really. I, that just came straight up out of my head. Uh, you can do something now. You could be all of you who are so brilliant here could be organizing all these other black students down there at the AU Center. They're doing about the same thing. Down there at the AU Center all across this country. Where, whatever happened to the conversation about reparations? Oh, I think we forgot that. There's a quick march that could be thrown together on that one. A million black students could certainly do that. We haven't talked about African Liberation Day in a long time, so at least we could do is start 
reparations for reparations and against the war. Where's our war? Where's our war protest? You know, back in the day, I remember when my mother and all her family, they scrubbed floors and did everything. You know, they call it scrubbing floors. We didn't say we were maids. <laughs> that was like a step up from what they did. <laughs> These women scrubbed floors, you know. <laughs> Hands and knees with a bucket, wringing out the rag. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. They scrubbed floors. And they scrubbed floors to put my Aunt Frances through college. All 18,000 of them, whatever it was, you know, scrubbed some floors and saved their little money so one child could go to college. You know those families because we're all part of those families, huh? They saved to go to college. But we didn't just send our children off to college so they could get a college education and go work for corporate America. We got down there and scrubbed some floors and shined some shoes and cooked some food and had chicken dinners and chitlin dinners so you could go to school and to the community so we could be uplifted. Those of you who want to become lawyers, I just told you that 50% of the people in prison today are black people. Now, a lot of you think that there is it's a political question because people go to Iraq and murder and rape every single day of the week and we don't ever call them murderers or rapists. We say it's war. It's just a war. I don't know anybody who has killed as many people as have been killed in Iraq by, any ha by, by many individual soldiers who are not in prison uh, who is in prison for killing that many people. So if you want to become a lawyer, even if you join the corporation, which I would like to urge you not to do, but let's say you do. <laughs> Give five hours a week or something to your brothers and sisters in the hood. Help them to get some decent housing. Help them to defend themselves against the plea bargain justice that exists in America today, because that's how they've gotten there. If you want to become a doctor, don't just become a doctor and, uh, and get a whole lot of money. Become a doctor and put something in the neighborhood for our people so that we don't have these high rates of breast cancer and, and, and prostate cancer. There's a brother named Dr. Friedman in Harlem. And Dr. Friedman has just set up a breast cancer clinic several years ago, and he got independent money. I'm gonna tell you who it was, because this is the shame of it. Got independent money to set up a clinic, and he has shown the reversal of, 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 of the life expectancy of black women in Harlem with breast cancer simply because they now have access to the resources to extend their lives because that's why we're really dying. There's nothing wrong with black women and our breasts. There's something wrong with making a decision between should I get a mammogram or should I pay my rent? And Dr. Friedman has gotten the money for that. And here's the saddest part about it. Who financed the whole clinic in Harlem is Ralph Lauren. Where is Shaquille O'Neal? Where is Oprah Winfrey? If you want to be a doctor, follow the Im image of Dr. Freeman in Harlem and put something in place for our people. If you want to be a teacher, don't just say you want to teach here or there or you want to and keep getting 15 more PhDs. Go down into the hood and help the public schools to teach our children something that they need to know in these public elementary schools. <laughs> if you want to be a contractor and make a lot of money, build some decent affordable housing for our people. You can do that. You're smart. You know how to do that stuff. Develop some banks for our people and some savings and loans and credit unions. What about some farms and some green spaces so we can eat? You know, when people tell me the problem with black people today is we're on a bad correct thing. We should be eating more vegetables. I love that one. More fresh vegetables. You're not going to go into the hood and find no fresh vegetables. <laughs> You're going to find a store that's going to sell you some human hair in a package. <laughs> You know that store, human hair in a package, some pig's feet in a jar, a beeper, maybe some weed, some cheap bologna that they're going to sell you at a high price, but you're not going to find any fresh vegetables. That's all I'm saying. And if you find any, it's very suspect anyway. Manufacture something, but manufacture good and decent clothing and hire our people. Don't go and exploit some women in, in Malaysia. 
You know, you got your Sean Johns and all out there doing the same thing that everybody else did, exploiting poor women around the world and wanting somebody to pay $75 for a little child's outfit. Make some hire some of our people so that we get paid a living wage and then we can have affordable things that we need in our lives to live every day. Manufacture everything from clothing to cars, I don't care, but begin to develop a sense of belonging of our people and developing and uplifting. Organize the black vote if you can't do anything else. You know you're not going to throw no bullets, so let's get to the ballot. <laughs> get rid of these bootlickers that are in the state legislature and in the, in the United States Congress people calling for the draft and calling themselves black men in America, and put in people who serve our interests. Fight in every way possible. Find some way to begin to engage in the fight to end poverty and the oppression of black people, not only in this country, but throughout the African diaspora. 50% of the world's poor, 50% live in sub-Saharan Africa. Commit your life to the realization of the day when we, we oppressed people, and all oppressed people, can actually say that it's true, that we are free at last, finally free at last. Thank you very much. <laughs>